Thank you so much and uh, assalamu alaikum everyone. Hello everyone. Um, depending on where you are, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it's, uh, it's that kind of uh, thing that we're getting used to nowadays. So uh, let me share with you my PowerPoint. Okay, so I hope everybody is able to see that. So uh, basically, uh, what I'll be talking about is Al-Ma'ida passage in Surah 5 of the Quran, and its allusion to the promise of the Spirit, which is in the final discourse of the Gospel of John, and its fulfillment in the Book of Acts. So just as a way of introduction, the, um, the Synoptic Gospels usually narrate the Last Supper uh, just before uh, just before Jesus is betrayed and then tried and crucified. Whereas in the Gospel of John, instead of narrating the uh, uh, Last Supper, instead there is this final discourse which he puts in its place. And in, in that final discourse, he basically promises the Holy Spirit to the disciples um, and tells them to, um, uh, uh, to basically be comforted. So he tries to comfort them. And, uh, and also at the very end of the uh, final discourse, there is um, in, in John 17, he basically has what is usually called the high priestly prayer in which Jesus prays fervently to God, uh, beseeching God uh, to uh, basically support uh, his disciples and not only his disciples, but also others who come to believe, uh, to believe through them as well. So let me give you a little bit of an introduction of what the Quranic Ma'idah is about and what the uh, final discourse is, is about uh, so that you can have a sense of what they discuss. So in the Quran, uh, at the, towards the end of Surah 5, which is called Surah Al-Ma'idah for the same namesake of the Ma'idah, which is typically understood as a table spread or a feast, uh, but there has always been a debate on e what exactly does the word ma'ida really mean. And it's not very surprising, by the way, because the, the, the root word ma um, is actually highly debated, not only in the Arabic language, but also in the Hebrew language. Uh, for example, the word me'od, me'od in, in Hebrew is also highly debated as well if, of what exactly its root meaning is. So in the Quranic Maida, uh, basically Jesus' disciples asks Jesus if God can send them a Maida from heaven. And Jesus responds asking them to be pious and replies, and they reply that they want to eat from it so that their hearts are comforted. And so that they know that he is truthful in his promise and that they would become witnesses to it. Jesus then prays to God to bring down the Ma'ida from heaven to be a feast or a witness for the first and the last and for it to be a sign from God. Then God responds that it shall descend, but if anyone disbelieves, they will be punished like no other person in the world. Then God asks Jesus afterwards, God asked Jesus if he had told the people to take him and his mothers and his mother as gods besides God. And Jesus praises God, saying that he would not say something that is not within his own rights. And that if he did say something like that, then God would have already known it. And then Jesus asserts that he only told them what God commanded him to worship God, his Lord and theirs. And then Jesus also says that he remained a witness to them as long as he was among them, as long as he was among the people, among the disciples. But when God caused him to die, it was God who remained as a protector for and a witness to them. And then Jesus beseeches God's forgiveness to the people, and God responds that this is the day that the righteous will have eternally, um, will have eternally rivers flowing from beneath them. So this is basically, in a nutshell, what the Quranic passage on the Ma'ida has. Now let's compare this a little bit with the Johannine final discourse, so uh, for those of you who are not uh, very familiar with it. So in the Johannine final discourse, after Jesus washes the feet of his disciples and predicts both his betrayal and Peter's denial, he starts with a long discourse. He comforts his disciples that he will leave but will come back to take them 
um, to be with him. And Jesus tells them that the words that he is saying are not really his own, but it is that of the Father. And Jesus promises the spirit of truth who will teach them and comfort them. And Jesus reminds them that he is doing only what the Father commanded him to do. Jesus urges his disciples to love, to believe in him, and to keep his commandments. He reminds them that when the spirit of truth come, they, um, um, which will uh, uh, proceed from the Father, um, it will be a witness uh, about him. So the, the spirit of truth will witness about him, and then they too will also be witnesses. He tells them that he must go so, uh, he must go so that the spirit may come, and that it will convict those who disbelieve in him. He repeats that the Spirit will guide them to all truth and confirms that though they will grieve, it will be turned to joy. Then Jesus' disciples confirm that they now know that Jesus knows everything and it makes them believe that he came from God. Jesus then responds, do you now believe? And again attempts to comfort their hearts. And then in the last section of the final discourse, the high priestly prayer, as it is sometimes called, Jesus prays to God, asking to be glorified. Jesus tells God that he has revealed God to his disciples and that they obeyed and believed. He then prays for his disciples. He beseeches God to protect his disciples since he is leaving and will no longer be able to do so as he did while he was among them. Jesus tells God that he lost none whom were entrusted to him except the one doomed to destruction in order to fulfill scripture. And although in, in that, in, in the high priestly prayer, it doesn't actually explicitly says who that is, but it is implying um, Judas who betrayed Jesus. Then Jesus repeats that he is not asking God to take the disciples out from the world, but to protect them. Then Jesus then prays not only for the disciples, but for all the believers. So this is in a nutshell, the Johannine final discourse. So those of you who were not familiar with the, with the Ma'ida, I hope uh, you got a little bit familiarized with it. And those of you who are not very familiar with the final discourse in, in the Gospel of John, I hope that you um, had um, a little bit familiar, um, uh, familiarity with the content of the final discourse. Now, when we look into the Ma'idah passage in the Quran, we can actually see that the Ma'idah passage can be divided into three separate sections. And those three separate sections can be done both thematically as well as if, um, from a literary perspective. Thematically, uh, basically, we could see that uh, the um, first verse, which is Quran 5, 110, uh, which can, we can call the introductory section, and it basically introduces uh, Jesus' miracles, introduces the Holy Spirit as well. Uh, and then we can see that there is the second section, which is the main body of the Ma'idah passage. It basically talks about how the disciples ask Jesus to, um, to bring down the Ma'idah and Jesus asking God to actually bring the Ma'idah from heaven. And then we can see a third section, which represents some sort of a will and testament of Jesus. It is more of a discourse between Jesus and God. Now also, now though thematically we can see how those themes um, can be divided uh, into those three sections, but not only so, from also a literary perspective, we can see that those three different sections are also divided using a specific marker. And that specific marker is using the, um, the Arabic word if, which simply means like um, when. So uh, basically the first, uh, verse uh, 110, which introduces uh, Jesus, introduces the Holy Spirit and uh, Jesus' miracles. It uses, it starts with, إِذْ قَالَ Allah, when God said. The second section starts with, وَإِذْ أَوْحَيْتْ, here basically God is narrating, and so it says, and when I inspired, so when God inspires, and it, it uses the word, um, the conjunction and, to, to recognize that it is a conjunction for the first section. And then the last section starts with um, verse 116, and it also starts with وَإِذْ قَالَ Allah and when God said. And again in here we see this conjunction conjoining the other two sections. So we can see basically three separate sections between uh, the, um, uh, in the Ma'idah passage in the Quran. 
Now, just for a little fun, I want to show you some inner Quranic parallelism between the, uh, the uh, Ma'idah passage in Surah Al-Ma'idah, in Surah 5 of the Quran, as well as with Surah 3 in the Quran, Surah Al-Imran. Because we see there are several commonalities, several parallelism between verses um, 5, 110 through 119, and um, uh, Quran 3 verses 35 through 64. So many parallelisms, so many commonalities. So I'm not going to go through each one of them for the sake of time, but just to see a little bit some of those parallelism and commonalities between them, which could tell us here that there is perhaps what we might call an inner Quranic illusion, which means that um, those passages are alluding to one another. Now, of course, from a historical perspective, one would say that uh, whatever chronologically was revealed later is perhaps alluding to the one that was revealed earlier. But in general, the intertextualities that exist between those two passages uh, basically could have several reasons. So uh, perhaps that they allude to each other um, the latter is alluding to the former, whichever was chronologically first, or that they both are using a similar source, whether an oral tradition or a text that they are engaging with independently, or perhaps both of those possibilities are true. However, what is interesting is that not all the information contained within them are solely found in either a specific gospel account, whether a canonical gospel or any of the pseudepigrapha or apocrypha. So it appears to be coming from a mixture of various traditions interweaved together. So perhaps the Quran is taking um, this information from several traditions. Okay. So let's look into the first section where the Quran introduces the spirit. Uh, basically, in the first section, which is in Quran um, uh, uh, Surah 5, verse 110, where it starts to introduce Jesus and the Holy Spirit and Jesus' uh, miracles, it says basically, when God said, Oh, Jesus, son of Mary, remember my blessing upon you and upon your mother when I strengthened you, and the word here used is a yet with the Holy Spirit. And the word here, ayyatuka, is very important because the word ayyada coming to means to strengthen or to help, but it also means an, um, like uh, an arm or, or a hand coming from the word yad. And what is interesting is that if the word ma'ida comes from a maf'al instead um, uh, of the root fa'al, so it might, its root might not really be from ma'ada, but from ayada, which means to help, to strengthen. And the Quran, by the way, throughout the Quran, every time the Holy Spirit is actually introduced, it is usually conjoined with the word ayatsuka or ayada. So it, it comes with this strengthening. So the Holy Spirit has this conjoinment with this root of ayada, which perhaps might be also the root of the ma'idah. We simply don't know for sure. But let's look now into the second section of the ma'idah. So in the second section of the ma'idah where Jesus' disciples uh, ask Jesus to have or to bring down the ma'idah, if God can bring down the ma'idah from heaven, the purpose behind their request is so that their hearts are comforted and so that they know that what Jesus says is true. So basically, it's, uh, the Quran basically shows that there is a, a several purposes for this ma'ida. One of them is to comfort them. And another one is to make sure that whatever Jesus says is true. Now let's compare this now with the final discourse in the promise of the Spirit in the Gospel of John. So according to the Gospel, of John, uh, before Jesus promises the Spirit, he actually tries to comfort his disciples. And after promising the Spirit, he again reiterates trying to comfort the hearts of his disciples. Um, and in John 16, 33 also, um, uh, later in the, in, the, uh, in the final discourse, also asks the disciples to be comforted in their hearts. Also in John 16, 6, basically the uh, Holy Spirit 
is you um, it it alludes to the Holy Spirit using the term Parakletos, which also means comforter. So one of the things perhaps that the Parakletos is doing is to comfort, to help, to assist the disciples. So we can see here some kind of parallelism, perhaps, with what we see in the Maida passage as well. Now, another thing that is important to look at in the Maida passage is that it says in the Quran that God warns that when the um, when the Maida so basically God says that I shall indeed send it down. So the Maida will be sent down. But whosoever among you disbelieves thereafter then they shall be punished. So God will punish them with a punishment wherewith no other person would have ever been punished in the whole world. And this is quite an interesting, a very interesting kind of, uh, of warning. But let's compare now this, let's compare this with the final discourse and the promise of the Spirit. So in the final discourse in the Gospel of John, well, one of the things that the Spirit will do when it comes is that it will convict the world. And the, and the Greek term for conviction, which is alingsai, uh, basically also means to punish. So it's going to convict, it's going to punish the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment and concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Here, of course, Jesus is speaking. So because they have not believed in God. And by the way, in the Aramaic Peshitta, so the Aramaic rendition of, um, uh, of the spirit convicting the world, uh, it uses the word, um, the world, uh, the word um, ulam as well, very much how it is also in the Quran. So here as well, um, again, uh, basically where it says that the person will be punished like no other person in the world. Um, now let's look into this a little bit closer. So let's closely analyze the logical statement that the Quran is ma making about this punishment. You see, it says, I shall surely punish him. So whoever disbelieves, I shall surely punish him with a punishment wherewith I have not punished any other person in all the worlds. So no one else. So imagine this. If a punishment will happen, no one else will ever be punished using that same kind of punishment. And the, Quran, and the Arabic word here is ahadan. Ahadan meaning like no one else. So it's a unique, it's, it's this singular person who will be punished that kind of, of way. So when we think of this logical statement, we will recognize that this warning is really for one person. Why? Because if two people are being punished the same punishment, then this statement will be false. Because it, you wouldn't, the statement wouldn't be able to say that um, uh, that I will punish him in, in a punishment with no other person in the world. Because there is someone else, the, the the second person who's being punished, right, with the same punishment. So logically speaking, when we look closely to the statement, it can only mean that one person is going to be punished like no other person in the world. Now, if we contextualize this with the promise of the Spirit, if we contextualize this with the final discourse and so forth, we will realize and when, and remember basically that this Quranic passage also says that whoever uh, basically uh, disbelieves thereafter, this punishment will happen. So let's look what happens or what we know about the fulfillment of the Spirit in the book of Acts. Judas is the only person who was punished because of his betrayal. So because Judas, um, uh, uh, because of Judas' betrayal um, uh, uh, of Jesus and the cause of what happened immediately after the final discourse in the Gospel of John. So... Judas was punished according to the book of Acts. So this is something also to keep in mind, this kind of parallelism. The Quran also suggests that there is going to be severe punishment to a unique singular person, because that's the only way to logically understand that passage. Now let's look into some other parallels as well. 
basically, the Quran, for example, when it talks about the Ma'ida passage, it says, um, uh, it says that Jesus, when Jesus prays to God to bring down the Ma'ida, it says, send down, uh, Jesus is praying to God, send down unto us a Ma'ida from heaven to be a feast for us. And the word, word for feast here is Eid. And the word Eid actually has is polysemous. It has many different meanings. But one of its meanings is, is it to be a feast. And what is interesting is that the fulfillment of the promise of the Holy Spirit also occurred in a festival. And there was during Pentecost, where it descended down, according to the book of Acts, um, as tongues of fire on the heads of, 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 uh, of Christ's apostles. So that's one thing that one of the words read could mean. But there's a, also another meaning that the word Eid can also mean. You see, in Hebrew, the word Eid also means witness. And what is interesting is that the Quranic passage, it says, it's to be Eid for us, for the first of us and the last of us, and for it to be a sign from you, right? So it's Eid for the first of us and the last of us. Now, if we imagine perhaps there is this usage of wordplay by the Quran. If we imagine it could mean to be a witness, so to be a witness for us, for the first of us and the last of us, and we compare that with the fulfillment of the spirit, of the promise of the spirit in the book of Acts. It says, for example, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So here again, that's a promise of the Spirit. So before Jesus ascends to the heavens, he still promises the, the Holy Spirit and says for it to be so that you may be a witness in Jerusalem. So being near in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria surrounding Jerusalem and to the end of the earth. So if we compare that with the Quran for the first of us and the last of us. And when we also basically see the fulfillment of the, of the Spirit, it basically says, and you will, um, uh, uh, Peter, for example, says in the book of Acts, re, uh, talking to the, uh, to the people, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. So again here, there is this kind of parallelism we see with the Quran um, saying for the first of us and for the last of us. For the first and for the last. So that's also another interesting kind of parallelism that we may be able to see. Now, Many of the scholars who looked into the um, uh, Ma'ida passages, many of them actually suggested that it's pretty much talking about perhaps the Last Supper or the Eucharist. The, um, uh, uh, so basically, uh, many of them have suggested that. Uh, and what I am suggesting, of course, I'm not saying that it is not. Actually, I do say yes. It is basically alluding to the Last Supper. It is also alluding to the Eucharist. But more importantly, it is basically trying to spiritualize, if you like, the Last Supper or the Eucharist. In, a, in the same way where the Gospel of John, instead of narrating the Last Supper, spiritualized it by giving this final discourse in its place. Now, the Ma'ida as a Eucharist, to understand it as a Eucharist, if the Ma'ida is coming from the root Yada, um, uh, Yada also means to praise and to give thanksgiving, which exactly what the word Eucharist is in Greek. The Eucharist is, is also um, a, a prayer of thanksgiving. And interestingly enough, the early churches actually uh, had basically... Uh, Basically, they felt that the Holy Spirit has a major role in the Eucharist. So in the early churches, they emphasized the role of the Holy Spirit in transforming the Eucharist. Obviously, of course, as it is, for example, in, um, in some of the traditions that the, the bread and the, uh, and the wine do turn into 
literally the uh, body and blood of Christ. And how does it do that? It's basically through this power of the Holy Spirit. And that is why the early churches, the prayers of the early churches over the Eucharist invokes the Holy Spirit and the transformative power of the Holy Spirit into the Eucharist, into the bread and wine. And we see that in the Syriac liturgy of Adai and Mary in the second century. We also see that in the apostolic tradition attributed to Hippolytus of Rome in the early third century. We also see that in the apostolic constitutions in the fourth century. We also see that in Ephraim the Syrian in the, um, uh, also in the fourth century. And also with John Chrysostom in the 5th century, as well as John of Damascus in the 8th century. So we could basically see the major role of the Holy Spirit on the Eucharist in the early churches, both pre-Quranic and post-Quranic. And so that allows us to recognize perhaps the Quranic milieu and, and the Christians whom the Quran is actually in conversation with in the 7th century. Now, of course, the final discourse, according to the Gospel of John, is situated during the Last Supper. So the Gospel of John completely skips the, the details of the Last Supper, um, uh, the details we can find perhaps in the Synoptic Gospels, but uh, for, some, for one reason or another, um, uh, John basically skips it and instead gives this lengthy final discourse in its place, which is unique to the Gospel of John. So the, the Synoptic Gospels don't really go into details of the final discourse. And uh, however, while the Last Supper um, uh, narrative is skipped in the Gospel of John, many biblical scholars, of course, said, but that doesn't mean that John completely ignored it. Uh, basically, he said, um, many scholars do suggest that John, uh, in his, uh, in, in his uh, gospel, uses throughout the gospel symbolism of the Last Supper. Uh, the bread, the wine, especially, of course, Jesus himself being the bread that comes down from heaven. And that, of course, also has an allusion not only to the Last Supper, perhaps, but also more importantly, um, to the Eucharist in many of the early churches. And so we could basically see that throughout the Gospel of John is that the Gospel highly spiritualizes the sacraments. And so the Last Supper is being spiritualized um, uh, uh, in, uh, in there. And, and that is why the, the final discourse comes in its place to spiritualize perhaps the message of the Last Supper. And uh, what is interesting also that just as in John, bread, it's the bread that comes down from heaven. The Quran, it's the Maida that comes down from heaven. So that's also a very interesting thing. But something that is also very important. So now we've been discussing on how the final discourse has many different parallels with the Maida passages in the Quran. But we mainly talked about the like the first and, and especially the second section of the Maida passage. But how about the third and la the last section of the Maida passage in the Quran? Uh, and if we try to compare that with the last section of the final discourse in the Gospel of John, which is in John 17. And we will be able to see now many different parallels that also exist between the final section of the Ma'idah and the high priestly prayer or John 17. Well, let's look into those parallels. For example, in the Quran's passage, it says that God questions Jesus if he has asked the people to take him and his mother as two gods instead of God. Now, when we compare that in the high priestly prayer, Jesus says in his prayer that he made the father known as the only true God. Now, in the Quran, for example, it says Jesus responds by glorifying God, saying subhanak. And in the, uh, in the high priestly prayer in John 17, Jesus frequently glorifies God. And in the Aramaic Peshitta, it uses the um, word shabah, the root shabah, um, which is also from the same root of, of the Arabic um, sabbah or subhanak as it is in this passage in the Quran. 
Another parallel we see is that the Quranic passage shows that Jesus was a witness to his followers while he was among them. So basically Jesus responds and says, well, I was a witness to them as long as I was among them. And when we look into John 17, it also shows us that Jesus was a witness that the disciples kept their word while he was among them. Now, also we see that uh, in the Quran, Jesus tells God that when, when God caused him to die, so when God caused Jesus to die, it is God who watches over them. And when we compare that also with the, uh, with the high priestly prayer in John 17, Jesus asks the father to watch over his followers because he's being taken away. And because he's being taken away, he asks God to be the watcher, to be the protector of his disciples once he's away. Another thing that we also see is that Jesus in the Quran, in the Quranic passage, Jesus does not wish to condemn the world uh, because even when, for example, it says that, uh, um, like in the Quran, it says that, well, if you want it, you, uh, you can punish them. So um, in the Quran, it shows um, God, um, Jesus praying to God, well, if you wished um, to punish them, you can punish them. But they are your, um, uh, you are, they are your ibad, they are your servants. But if you forgive then you are the most merciful. So we can see in the Quranic passage that Jesus tries not to condemn even those who basically would um, perhaps um, suggest something differently. Uh, and we can also see in the high priestly prayer in John 17, um, uh, basically that Jesus loves his disciples and wishes that they be with him. So he doesn't want anyone to be condemned. He wishes them, he loves them, and he wants them to be with him. And of course, you can compare that with another part of, of the Gospel of John, where the Son was not sent to condemn the world. So the Son is not there to condemn the world. And we can see in the Quran, Jesus also does not want to condemn the world, even if they were disbelievers, even if they did some, some um, problems, he still does not, he does not wish for them to be condemned. He still beseeches God's forgiveness and mercy. Also, we see in the Quranic passage that Jesus prays that his followers are not afflicted so that they are not um, uh, punished. And we also see in, in the high priestly prayer that uh, Jesus prays that the Father protects his followers from evil and affliction. Another thing in the Quranic passage, for example, it says that the truthful will be rewarded. So basically, um, God responds that the truthful will be rewarded. And in the high priestly prayer, we see that uh, uh, Jesus asks the Father for his followers to be sanctified in truth. Also in the Quran, for example, it says in, 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 towards the very end of, of this final section uh, of the Ma'idah, it says that God is content with them and they are content with him. Radiallahu anhum wa radu an. So they are, God is content with them and they are content with him. And the root word radia here is also very important. Now, what is interesting is in John 17, um, it is filled with the term to glorify. The word glorify is repeated so many times and it's using the Greek root dokeo. The Septuagint translates the Hebrew rasa, which means to be content and to be pleased, cognate to the Arabic radaya, using the same root dokeo, which is eudokia, um, um, to be pleased. So we can also here see that there are some um, parallel terms as well that is being used in the final section um, of the Ma'idah passage in the Quran, as well as in the high priestly prayer. And then also in the Quranic passage, in the last section, it says that this is the great triumph. This is the great victory. And when we compare this with the final discourse in the Gospel of John, well, just before, just before John 17, so just before the high priestly prayer in, in John 17, um, uh, just immediately before it, uh, basically, Jesus says that he has overcome the world. 
and the Greek word used as overcoming the world, world is, is me, also means that basically that Jesus has been victorious and triumphant over the world. And so we can see here also this kind of parallelism with the Quranic passage. Now, another thing we could also see between the Quranic uh, passage uh, here and the Gospel of John, generally speaking, not just the final discourse, is the river motif. Um, in the final um, section of the Ma'ida passage, it basically shows how the, um, uh, it, it basically says that those who are, um, who are righteous, who, will, are, um, uh, who are truthful, they will, be, they will basically have rivers flowing from beneath them. And that's a very important motif in the Gospel of John, because in the Gospel of John, this water motif and the river motif is usually a symbol for the spirit. It's the symbol for the spirit. So it's if we basically consider this river flowing from beneath them as the spirit perhaps um, uh, flowing from beneath them, perhaps that's what the Quran is trying to also allude to. So when we're looking into the context of um, uh, the final section of the Ma'idah passage in the Quran, and uh, we can see it's pretty much parallels a lot of what is happening in John 17 and the high priestly prayer. What's also interesting is that even stylistically, so not only from the contextual perspective, but also from a stylistic perspective, uh, as, as we discussed, as I discussed earlier, the final section stylistically is distinct, right? It, it, it forms its own section among the, all the Ma'ida passage. It, it has its own um, uh, separate section. And it's the same also with John 17. So stylistically also, John 17 is also distinct because in, in, uh, in the final section of the Ma'idah passage, it's basically a discourse between God and Jesus. Um, uh, and it's the same thing with John 17. It's the final discourse, yes, but it, it, in that final section in John 17, it's a discourse, again, it's a prayer, it's a discourse between um, Jesus and God. So it's a prayer um, that Jesus is praying for the Father. So stylistically speaking, we also see these kinds of parallels as well. Therefore, we could say perhaps that whatever was preceding the final section of the Ma'ida passage um, could truly be an allusion to the final discourse in the Gospel of John. In other words, if the final section of the, of the Ma'ida passage is in parallel with the high priestly prayer of John 17, then that gives us reason to also suggest that the um, second section, so the section that precedes the final section in the Quran, is also paralleling the final discourse just preceding the high priestly prayer. So in that sense, perhaps that the Ma'idah uh, is also basically alluding to the promise of the Spirit, which is itself, of course, situated as well within the Last Supper. So the Ma'idah is perhaps not just the Last Supper, but it appears to be that the Quran is also doing perhaps what the Gospel of John is doing, spiritualizing the Ma'idah, spiritualizing this food that they are going to eat. So it is not a literal food that the, 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 the disciples will be eating, but it is this kind of spiritual food that the Gospel of John um, frequently uses um, throughout his Gospel. So we can basically see also that the context make some kind of parallelism between them. Now, there are so many different um, intertextualities between the Ma'idah passage in the Quran and the biblical account concerning the promise of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not going to go through each and every one of them, uh, of course, due to the time, but uh, I, you can basically uh, see that uh, um, the many different. So in total, I basically counted so far 49, but uh, this is work on, in progress. So I haven't yet completed this, uh, uh, this, but it's, it's still work in progress. But this is here is a table of the summary of intertextualities, and it goes almost to about 49 of them and uh, perhaps still counting. Okay, so in conclusion, so let's go now to the conclusion. All this. In conclusion, the Ma'idah in the Quran 
is not only a table of food descending from heaven. And the Ma'idah in the Quran is not only an allusion to the Last Supper, and it is not only perhaps an allusion to the Eucharist, later as it is understood and interpreted by the early churches. But the Ma'idah is also an allusion to the final discourse. It's also to spiritualize the Last Supper. It attempts to spiritualize this food as the Gospel of John attempts to. Um, and it is an allusion to the promise of the Spirit. And therefore, the Ma'idah passage makes use of the symbolism from the Gospel of John. So with that, I'd like to thank you all very much for your very kind attention. And uh, I, this is still work in progress. And so if you do have any comments, any feedback, uh, please do let me know. So thank you all so much for your very, very kind attention and for your patience.